in their lives as they lead it. Then they the people will go to the Constitution. If you believe your religious beliefs are being challenged, and you've been denied your right to be who you are and to have your rights to conscience, then you look to the Constitution. Any form of abuse, that's not just the ordinary, petty, personal thing, but somehow reaches you because you are who you are, could become a constitutional matter. In that respect, civil society has a huge role to play in constitutionalism. Because civil society, more than any other group, NGOs, becomes a link between people in the communities and the constitutional order. And society gains uh, a lot of uh, experience, both in getting publicity, which is important, <coughs> and in getting buyers to bring cases to where when it's appropriate. So that, that's the other aspect of the role of the constitution. Then the constitution is there when government passes laws and they're going to deny the rights to the people. We have in big countries debates in South Africa now about proposed media tribunal. I won't say anything about it. As a former judge, I have to uh, sometimes zip up my lips. But what I do know, what I can say, is if the law goes too far, if the law gives powers to the tribunal that infringe the guaranteed rights of the Constitution, the press can go to the Constitutional Court and they can get a judgment and the government will listen to that judgment. And that's very important for keeping the oxygen, if you like, the arteries open. We have a right to information. Right to information is fundamental. Uh, it's particularly important for poor people. The government has got the information. They want to know what's happening. They want to understand what's happening. If the government doesn't give the information, if you go to a lawyer, the lawyer can apply for it. <coughs> government sometimes tries all sorts of tricks Expensive, take too long, you go back to court. So there are all sorts of ways in which the Constitution becomes very meaningful. We have strong labor rights in our Constitution. And uh, there are constitutional rights protected. The right to strike with reasonable limitations, the right to collective bargaining, the right to have independent unions. All of these independent employers associations are all in the Constitution. So you will find workers in the workers' congresses, I won't say the constitution is just for the, uh, the capitalists, the bourgeois, uh, the, the, the big people, the constitution is for us as well. I think the strongest impact of our constitution has been in relation to the rights of women. Uh, and there it comes indirectly and indirectly. Uh, it's, it's, um, we, we, have, we haven't dealt with the issue of polygamy directly in South Africa as a constitutional question. Um, and to the extent that the Constitution permits separate forms of family law, if Parliament passes that, it means that polygamy can be practiced. And our President, in fact, has taken a second and third part way, uh, setting that example. It hasn't been challenged as being unconstitutional because it violates equality as such. But where the courts have come in, is when a second wife or a third wife on divorce is left with nothing. Nothing under the civil law system and the imams supporting the husband in relation to maybe the first wife. The courts will come in to protect the rights of the vulnerable parties. Uh, it comes out in, in many other different respects in terms of which patriarchy has been used as a cultural practice deny women their full participation in life. We had a very big case dealing with um, the rights of people in a tribal community to have a woman as their leader. And the royal family chose the woman, a woman to succeed the incumbent, who was a man. The incumbent signed on, but before he died, his son told him, no, 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 uh, you're making a mistake. This is against our culture. And the incumbent changed his mind. The government appointed the woman. The son of the incumbent went to court. The high court accepted the argument that culture only allows the eldest male son to succeed. The um, Court of Appeal agreed with that, that a traditional leader is born, can't be elected, can't be chosen. It 
attention our cause. And we say, no, culture is a living crisis. Uh, customary law is living customary law. The people themselves want to change it. And they have the right to change it, particularly when the changes are in keeping with the spirit and the principles of our new constitutional order. And today, she is now the leader, the traditional leader, because of the general values of the Constitution being applied in relation to customary law. And when we had that hearing, uh, two bus loads of women came down from that area to attend the hearing. And the courtroom wasn't big enough, so the one bus load sat in the first session from 10 o'clock to quarter past 11. We had a tea break, they went out, and the other bus load came in. It was very wonderful for me being in the court to see that. I just end up with the very last case that we heard dealt with a question of pit latrines uh, of a very poor community. And they were saying the government had provided them with latrines. Do you understand latrines? Uh, so people are living in shacks. They don't have toilets. And the government provides these toilets. And the government gave them concrete toilets. And they wanted what they called VIPs. The VIP is a ventilated, improved toilet. And I was very moved. The highest court in the land. My very last case after 15 years. And it's people coming to claim their rights to dignity, to a better kind of toilet than they would have had. And the people came to the court. And uh, the council for the local authority uh, Apologize. They said, we have a housing program that's taken three years, and that's why the problem is there, because we should have improved, upgraded altogether. I apologize. And the chief of the court said, don't apologize to the judges, apologize to the community. And he turned around and he apologized in the African language. And the community were very happy to feel that they understood. We didn't give them their order. We said that it would be too expensive in the circumstances, and they were going to get new homes anyhow. So the claim was not a legally justified claim, but their right to come to the court was important. And that's because of our constitution. Our constitution has social and economic rights written in there. And the people who suffer the most for lack of social and economic rights tend to be women. Women in women-headed households, the men are way working somewhere else. They feel the impact of lack of education, lack of water, lack of food, lack of homes, lack of medicine. And these are issues that come to the courts um, through the whole constitutional process. So there's no reason why a constitution should be the property of the elite, of the lawyers, of people like me, or like us in this room. Uh, people like us in this room, I think we're all democratic, and we all would be really happy if the Constitution was seen as belonging to the whole nation. And I think that's part of the public education process that's required, not just fancy uh, abstract ideas, but what the Constitution can mean for people. In terms of local government, yes, we have a chapter on local government in the Constitution, and it gives autonomy, a fair degree of autonomy to local government. So we have three spheres of government, national government, provincial government, and local government. And each one is a complete government in itself. Uh, most of the revenue goes to national government. Uh, local government also can collect property taxes and uh, to save electricity and water services, they get quite a lot of money. Uh, and it's quite a complicated relationship between the, the spheres of government. But the idea of local government having autonomy uh, is entrenched in the Constitution. And now I live in Cape Town. Cape Town is not under ANC control. Uh, it's under control of an opposition party. The province I'm in is under control of an opposition party. It's very healthy for democracy. If I vote for them or not, that's not the question. It's the right of the people in the province, in the locality, to choose a government that they want. And we had many, many cases coming to our court dealing with the powers and responsibilities. I think one of the earlier speakers 
and so it was the president of, of um, Corporate Indonesia was speaking about responsibilities uh, in this morning session. And we speak about the responsibilities of local government to provide electricity, to provide water, the duties on them, but also the duties of people to pay for the services that they get and, and to uh, express their grievances uh, in, in an appropriate way. But local government is a very important part of our constitution. There are other areas where the constitution doesn't include all the details of the law. It says Parliament shall pass a law providing, for example, for the right to information. So the right to information uh, in public hands uh, is guaranteed in the constitution and Parliament is given two years to pass a law to make that like a right operational. Uh, we have a labor relations law that's similar to that. There are a number of areas where Parliament has the duty of filling in all the functional practical details. The Constitution doesn't have that, but the Constitution lays down the basic values and the basic format. Question to the panelists. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Institutions and the, the issue of justice itself. Um, the way I believe that the Constitution, as the justice has just said, has to have the principle in that according which according to which laws are are, are drafted. Um, I, but I also remind you that in our part of the world, and in countries like Jordan, sometimes what is obvious needs to be stated and restated in the Constitution in many ways in order for the principle to be accepted as being part of the rule of law in the country. And I give an example of the independence of the uh, independence of the judiciary. Uh, the independence of the judi judiciary is a principle that I think is embedded in all our constitutions, and yet we see that the judiciary is the weakest link in the, as a branch of government. And therefore, uh, there, are, there is a need to re restate the independence of the judiciary the principle of the independence of the judiciary from different aspects. Uh, besides the institutional independence, we need to uh, prohibit ex uh, in an express way that uh, special courts are not allowed. Uh, there's a need to stress on the importance of the independence of the individual judge and their right for association and so on. And so sometimes uh, uh, you feel that there is a need to for some kind, it's, it's a repetition, but the repetition is to uh, ensure that principle becomes entrenched within the legal system of uh, the country. Uh, some other issues relating to uh, accountability, for example, how power and responsibility are uh, interlinked, uh, the, the importance of having the general expenses, uh, expenses of the country being pro prioritized accor in accordance to the needs of the country. And I give an example, for example, our, in our uh, budget, uh, more uh, uh, 1.700 uh, million is given to military expenses, and 1.5 is given to the civil expenses, which is the health, the education, and so on. And when you look at a country like Jordan, who is, has a treaty, uh, peace treaties with, with Israel, then there is no need to have that much amount of money allocated for the military expenses, for example. So there's, I think, a need when we revisit our constitution to look into these uh, issues and really uh, cater for the basic needs of the people through, uh, uh, through regulating issues related to finance and economics. Another thing is uh, there's a need to, uh, to declare that there is a fine line between public office and engaging in commercial and business activities. Again, this might sound uh, something that is uh, well known, but yet it is needed to be uh, embedded in the uh, Constitution. But I guess if I want to answer with one, one idea, I would answer and say that there is always a need to stress about the independence of the judiciary. If we have an independent judiciary in, in our countries, I think half of the battle is won. Uh, I want to pick up this question of women that you've raised, and I think this is very important not just to say 
لهذا الطرق صياغة للأسف الخمسة هي لم تكن في الحقيقة تعكس التوجه العام للمجتمع بقدر ما كانت تعكس التوجه الدولي. Both constitutions and drafting that reflected the direction or the, uh, the, 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 the uh, thesis or the thinking of the government and not the people. وذلك يبدو واضحا من خلال اللجنة التي كانت تكلف بوضع مسودة الدستور. That was clear by looking at the committee that was mandated to set up the constitution. حيث غالبا ما كان الملك يعين أحد المستشارين لوضع الدستور. Usually the king mandated or delegated one of his advisors to write or draft the constitution. حيث أن هذه اللجنة كانت تضع دستورا يعكس قوة الدولة تجاه أطراف المعارضة. So it always these constitutions were in favor of the state power versus the opposition. لكن هذا لا يعني بان هناك اختلاف او هناك كل مره يضع دستور منذ 1962 تضع دساتير تضاف اشياء جديده تساهم في انتهاء الدوله على المجتمع وعلى احزاب المعارضه. لا في كل دستور بعض اخر كانت تاتي بعض الاشياء الايجابيه التي كانت تساهم في تقريب الوجهات ما بين الدوله والمعارضه. But uh, in those five constitutions, we noticed that each one of them, um, uh, when you had the new constitution, it always gave some sort of um, rapprochement between the state and the opposition, some positive matters. Until we got this last constitution, it was uh, passed in 1996, and the opposition took power in 1997. It was, a, it was approved by the opposition. But the problem we always had since the independence until this very moment was the result is that we got this 1996 constitution and the articles therein are good in principle. Because it states that Morocco is committed to human rights as internationally stated and and it also says that the judicial system is independent. The problem we always had in the constitutions is that the constitutions uh, uh, had so many good things, but in terms of the political practice, it was not, the political practice was not in favor of the citizens, but usually in favor of the state and the state power. But after the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions, and also after the demands of the young people in Morocco on the 20th of February, of these demands, corruption and toppling the government and dissolving the, the parliament. The king decided and mandated the new committee to draft a new constitution to fit the new situation. لكن السؤال الذي يطرح هو ما الفرق ما بين الدساتير الخمسة السابقة والنقاشات الدائرة الآن حول الدستور الجديد في المغرب. But the question that I can pose here, what's the difference between this constitution that this committee is trying to draft right now, the difference between this this constitution and the previous ones, the five previous constitutions? من وجهة نظري أنا أعتقد أن هناك مؤشرين اثنين. From my personal opinion or view, I think there are two main indicators. المؤشر الأول هو أن اللجنة الحالية هي مكونة من عشرين فردا. This commission we've set set it up a constitution now. It has twenty members. وتتكون من خبراء وأساسي لجامعيين مغاربة. It includes Moroccan professors and experts. 
لم نسمها طيبه في في الاوسط الاجتماعيه والسياسيه وكذلك الثقافيه المغربيه they have a good reputation at all levels cultural political levels in Morocco والمؤشر الثاني the second indicator هو ان منهجيه اشتغال هذه اللجنه that the approach and method used by this commission هي ان لما بدات في لما طلقت بهذه المهمه بدات بالانصات الى مختلف الشرائح الاجتماعيه. That when it was mandated to do this job, it started by listening to the different social strata. وانا بدوري قدمت امام هذه اللجنه ورقه او مشروع مذكره لاصلاح الدستور باسم منتدى الشباب المغربي للاقليم الثالث. And uh, on behalf of the uh, youth forum in Morocco, I personally submitted sort of a draft paper uh, to this commission. لهذا انا اعتقد الان هي هذه اللجنه هي موضوعه في سياق هو مجبره على تجميع المعطيات وتجميع اهم الافكار التي عليها توافق مجتمعي. So this commission is forced now to put in place all the points or ideas or principles that are sort of agreed upon among, among all the social strata in Morocco. وبالتالي فنحن نعتقد أو نزعم بأن الدستور المقبل قد يكون انتقال فعلي لضمان توازن الصلة. So I believe that this coming constitution, I claim it, it can be um, a good constitution that has some sort of balance of powers. والضامن الفعلي لممارسة الحقوق والواجبات في في المغرب. And it will ensure the, uh, the practices and the application of rights and duties in إذا تبقى الوقت يمكن أن نناقش ما هي أهم الأفكار التي هناك مؤشرات على نوع من التوافق بشأنها.